All right, good morning, and welcome to Web3 Wednesdays, where we chat through some of the complex and nuanced topics in crypto and Web3 at large so that you can stay ahead of the curve. So today, I'm joined by Steve Cho. He's a partner and head of play over at Mechanism Capital, which is a prominent crypto venture fund in the space with a prolific history across both DeFi and gaming. Steve himself previously led business efforts at Apple to understand blockchain gaming and NFTs in the context of the App Store and brings with him a wealth of experience at the intersection of traditional and Web3 gaming. So his deep understanding of the broad trends impacting the gaming market, coupled with a very nuanced understanding of the exact rules and regulation standards the industry titans hold an iron grip over, make Steve a fantastic resource for scoping out where the space goes from here. And we're keen to get his take on the matter. So Steve, welcome to the show. Sam, thanks for having me. And I got to tell you, I wish I could take that introduction and take you wherever I go, because that was probably one of the best introductions I've ever oh, done. I so love that. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate the time here. Well, we're, we're going to go on tour after this, Steve. We'll, we'll, I'll be your hype <laughs> man. Well, <laughs> so I guess, you know, jumping right into it, can you explain a little bit about, you know, your background and how that kind of dovetails with your current role at Mechanism? Yeah, sure. Uh, no problem. Um, when I look at kind of like my current role currently at Mechanism, um, and I'll just start there because I think it's important for everyone to kind of know what I do at Mechanism currently right now. So um, I, I co-lead actually partner efforts um, for basically looking at like our, our Web3 gaming deal flow and also our, any sort of like decentralized application deal flow as well. And uh, part of that is obviously having a strong narrative and what we think is really kind of the future of Web3. And I think everyone has an opinion on what it is. And we all don't know exactly where it's headed. But uh, the, the best part about being in Web3, I think, right now in blockchain technologies is th just the amount of just interest we're seeing, not only um, in um, just overall like a blockchain, but within like actual decentralized applications. I, I, I find that fascinating. And when I see that interest, I mean interest not just from like the crypto community, but obviously from Web2.0 companies out there with a, with a thirst for wanting to learn more. And I, I'll get that more, get more into that with my experience at Apple. But at Mechanism, that's basically what I've been doing is I've been helping to kind of stand up me Mechanism Play and at the same time looking through deals and trying to continue to inform and educate not only our portfolios, but overall other projects as well as, uh, as a way to be able to provide them some level of insight before they approach the App Store and the way they actually conduct themselves and the way they actually submit their apps for cons consideration. Um, and I, I, I try to be helpful as well in that regard. So that's what I do at Mechanism. Um, now, how did I get to Mechanism? Uh, that's actually a, a longer answer. Um, uh, my, my, my road to Mechanism actually started um, basically at my first startup back in 2013, which wow. is called Keep. Yeah, Keep is a mobile ad technology startup. It's not your standard mobile ad technology start startup like uh, with programmatic advertising. In fact, programmatic advertising back in 2013 is when it really started taking off. But we took a different approach. We really wanted to be able to take advertising and disrupt it. And what do we mean by disrupting an advertisement? At the time, the prevailing models of ad units were either a banner ad or a video ad or a full unit interstitial on an, on an actual device for mobile. So what we want to do instead was be able to reward users um, in that moment with an, a reward. And that reward, uh, albeit, is actually from our brand sponsor. So let's say you hit a high scoring moment in this game called Mega Jump. And it was an actual game that actually had our, our rewards SDK in it. By hitting that high scoring moment, what we would do is say, hey, congratulations, that's a high scoring moment. And Skittles would like to reward you with a pack of Skittles that are redeemable at a 7-Eleven. It made perfect sense. And you would think that actually that that type of... Uh, that type of ad mechanic will work really well. But for advertising, it's, it's a bit different because they buy standard formats and anything beyond that's like experiential. And, and the reality is we did a great job of being able to kind of push performance and show good results, but to actually kind of engage in what's considered to be programmatic, programmatic advertising, which is now, guess what we call it? Performance marketing to a certain degree, right? Uh, if you've got RTB and all the other things, like that was a sweet science and, and Keep didn't really fit within the constructs of that. So um, that was actually my first startup. That was in 2013. Uh, but ironically enough, it was at my first startup there at Keep, um, although I was like heads down to mobile advertising, that um, I actually encountered something else and that was Bitcoin. So it just so happened that my biz dev team that um, I was working with, they were really, really interested in cryptocurrency. I, I didn't quite understand how much until I actually went there and noticed that they were wasting a lot of time on some sort of like uh, uh, website that had a blue screen. And I went over this and said, what is that? They go, oh, that's Coinbase. So 2013 is when I got to Bitcoin. Um, I wish I could tell you that I was like a technological genius and knew exactly where this was all headed. No, I was probably um, someone that really was fascinated by it and felt like if if there was a, an opportunity potentially for the internet to have its own money, this could be kind of it. And I thought it was really powerful. So 
ever since then, I've, I've been in cryptocurrency. Um, and I would say that out of that, like, obviously, I keep, you know, that was about two and a half of my years. And after that, I was at another startup called Lutzi. Lutzi was also kind of a rewards-based uh, type of startup with, with advertising. But think along the lines of more of a reward wall, so like a tap joy type of situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, both actually ended up not doing well. Like we both ended up being, um, uh, there was either exits on both. And, and I would say that overall, like when I look back, that, back at that experience, I left with probably like a, like a lot of knowledge, but, but a sense of like, Hey, look, I didn't really kill it. Like I wanted to in tech. And so luckily enough through all that, um, and, and, and looking back at it now, it's even more like real to me because I remember at that, that's the second one. I'm just like, look, like doing a little soul searching, where does it go from here? And the reality was this, it went further than I ever thought. And what I mean by that is that um, just when my, my second startup was in the process of probably like unwinding, um, it was another person at my first startup that was working at Apple. And he literally told me there was an opening on his team. And um, I interviewed 13 interviews later, like literally 13 interviews later. <laughs> so, um, it's a wild process. I, you know, right? I, I, there's a final boss fight. I'm not even joking, but like it was, um, I got the I got the job, and the job I got at the App Store um, for Apple was specifically working on the business management team for games. And kind of the remit of the team is very simple: it's to grow the games business for the App Store. And and understand that this specific area of the App Store that I worked at is an Apple Arcade. Apple Arcade is a service; it's treated differently. Um, they have different like success met metrics, right? Um, what we're, I predominantly managed and helped um, with editorial and featuring was around um, our free to play games business. So, example would be something like Zynga. Jam City, Roblox, um, the other developers that typically, um, uh, you know, get a developer um, agreement with us and potentially distribute on store. Um, so that was four and a half years of my life at Apple, like really focused on that. The area I say I specialize the most on was user generated content experiences. So UGC, I also specialized in anything that was considered to be like, um, I, I don't want to use the metaverse, but think along the lines of massive online games yeah, these, so, these big pre-web three experiences i know exactly yeah, what you're talking about yeah that, that's kind of it and i would say that the last bit was when we kind of put all that those pieces together this was like 2017 when i started apple i was already very much passionate about talking to the app store about blockchain technologies and nfts and i i did i actually tried my best to kind of make people aware and that's really kind of that when you look at these centralized platforms awareness is the first step and i thought that in, in 2017, when I first started to gain some level of curiosity and interest, that's when Crypto Kitties had like literally probably broke, not break, but like Ethereum obviously had trouble scaling with Crypto Kitties, right? Just that traffic alone. So I think the cycle over there, when, when I look at that cycle, like that, like that, that cycle was over. But um, luckily, it wasn't until recently that we had the second wave of NFT interest. And I would say that when we look at from an app store perspective, the area that I think was fascinating to me was around NBA Top Shot. Mm -hmm. It was really the Dapper Labs um, execution because it showed that you can you can uh, come up with a digital collectible, have it on the internet, and it was something that at the time Apple wasn't participating, right? Uh, and, I, and I thought that was fascinating. And then following that up with Axie Infinity as well and their actual volume, and this is a digital commerce volume happening on the internet that isn't happening on a centralized platform at all. And that is fascinating, right? So I think for, for us as a store, that piques curiosity when you see significant sales volume happening on the internet and it's oh, digital yeah. content. Why are we not participating? Not that we have to, but it, it does beg the question. So out of that, um, I ended up want, uh, deciding that I wanted to lead efforts to figure out exactly if there was an opportunity with NFTs, what would it look like and how could we potentially Apple participate in that? And what could we potentially do around that? Uh, and I just went around just, it was exploratory, just getting more information. So mm -hmm. that's kind of when I left Apple, that was January of this year. Um, and the reason why I left is because I got to a point where doing a lot of these exploratory uh, interviews and learning more, just listening sessions, I learned that like the opportunity was massive and I got really excited. And I decided that although like most of my time was spent um, pretty much being in crypto, but not necessarily someone that was outspoken, it was time to just come out and be able to just help these, 100%. these uh, gaming companies, right? And rather than like speaking in what I believe is very much important Apple speak, um, I wanted to be able to help them, like genuinely help them and be able to do things I could do that I potentially can do at Apple. So I, I resigned in January and I joined Mechanism. Um, and I joined Mechanism because I knew Andrew Kang even before all this, mm -hmm. uh, just in crypto. And he basically um, really wanted someone to come in and head up gaming because of the fact that there was a lot of gaming deal flow. So I was kind of a good fit, right place at the right time. But to be honest, man, when I kind of look at my entire career, 
it's not really lucky. There's a lot of luck there. There's a lot of failure there. <laughs> no, Steve, of- it takes it takes a lot of humility to say that. And I, I, I love that about you. Um, no, and I, I think that that background, you know, it frames you so well for really trying to understand, like, where does Web 2 sit with respect to Web 3, particularly around mobile gaming, uh, you know, App Store, Google Play Store type stuff. Um, and, you know, it kind of getting into it uh, from a business perspective, even do you see traditional Web2 gaming being challenged by the rise of Web3 gaming? How do you kind of see those two sitting with respect to each other? It's a it's a really good question. And, and I can tell you the way I see it, I, I don't see it as being competitive. And the reason why I don't see it being competitive is when I look at the state of free to play currently right now. And, and if you look across the landscape of free to play, I would say that in the last five years, um, when you look at the innovation, there hasn't really been, in my opinion, significant innovation in free-to-play. And this is, mind you, free-to-play gaming is a well-oiled, efficient machine. These games are very efficient. As much as people think there's art behind these games, if there is art, there's a lot of math and science and a lot of smart people that are out there. They're able to get down to a point where they, they fully understand the LTV. They fully understand the CAC. They know what the cost is user acquisition. They go into the return on ad spend. Like, it is performance marketing to its finest. And I would say that, when we look at kind of where it's at right now, and I look at the games that are out there right now free to play, um, I don't know how many breakout hits we've had in the last like year or two years or three years or four years, but I would say this the, the amount and frequency of these breakout hits are less. I'd say that in fact, gaming and these games that are out there right now, there's less sequels and, and, and rightfully so because these games are now live operated machines, right? It's, a, it's better to de-risk this way. But the reality is when we take a look at all these different things they've done to make it even more efficient, the question is, what is the next big quantum leap opportunity for these free-to-play gaming companies to inject something new, something amazing into their actual gameplay that I believe um, could potentially give these games a new life and a new type of direction in the way they actually make the games, right? And it could, and, and I would say that when I look at Web3 and, and in my talks with other like um, free-to-play gaming companies just in general that I feel like I just talked to generally, not pointing out one, uh, I think the results were across the board that everyone was interested. They, they saw uh, an opportunity potentially that this could be something, this idea behind potentially digital ownership of an asset within a game for a player to own. Powerful. This idea behind potentially buying a bunch of um, hard currency in one game and having the ability to take that fungible token of, of currency and move it to another game and not necessarily have the act the actual tokens or mm-hmm. that curve be locked in that game forever because you just stop playing it. And that, that type of synergy is just, it, it's so impossible to touch in a Web 2 capacity. So I understand where you're coming from that, you know, they, they may not even ultimately be competitive forces, that these ultimately may just sit synergistically or even parallel to each other, right? They could. And I, and I believe that, um, in fact, um, when you kind of look at even further, like with some of the things that these these uh, free-to-play gaming companies have tried to do in the past, like even universal currency across an entire mm-hmm. uh like an entire studio and having universal currency to be able to apply across all their, their games um, allows them to do very creative things with economies and with offers and other things like that. Right. Um, yeah. And I, and I have, I, I can think of some anecdotes, but I think for the purpose of time, I'll probably not really stipulate too much about it, but I can tell you this, like imagine if there was a casino game in this casino game, uh, you would earn loyalty points. And in this loyalty point casino game, all purely based upon engagement, could you potentially then have, uh, a reward wall there for you to to get uh, a car, an NFT car that's playable, interoperable in one of the car racing games that this actual studio owns. How powerful is that? Like you get oh, yeah. an digital item that you can use uh, the Testarossa you ever want, right? Now I could go in there and play this racing game. And, and now that casino game becomes even more um, engaging and more, and there's, there's more of engagement to actually have something. And you're not really owning anything of value per se, because again, it lives in the other game, right? And I think that's those type of like things are intriguing to me. Like, what could happen with interoperability? What could these they they do with like um, with actually having a universal currency or even injecting a loyalty point system that isn't necessarily something that they just came up with on their own, but actually was decentralized and people could see across and see that it's transparent the way the loyalty points are actually done. Um, intriguing to me. So uh, the long the answer to that question, I guess, it's a long winded one. Is this? I think that Web 2.0 and Web 2.5 companies um, right now, um, when it comes to Web 3, I don't think they, they see it as competitive. I think what they really want to see is whether or not it's real. And I think the same thing goes for centralized platforms. I think the reason why is because there's a lot of wait and see. The wait and see comes from the fact that I think 
right now with Axie doing what it did and NBA Top Shot doing what it did and some of the other notable projects that are out there right now um, that I won't plug. But like the point is like these projects, um, if they continue to show momentum and trajectory and continue to consistently drive significant sales volume on the internet, is this smoke that I think Web2, Web2. Web2 and Web2.5 companies need their, their game developers as well as centralized platforms to know this is a real opportunity and we should start investing, we should start building toward it. I think right now where we're at is a very interesting time for Web3 because it's, it's almost like after what happened, after Axie's success, we're all kind of waiting. What's the next big game to come out? And I'm very, very hopeful because obviously at Mechanism, we, we made some investments with our Porcos. And I, I'm very like hopeful that, um, that some of them, that, that they're going to go out there and be able to kind of achieve that, that type of level. If not, like I, I, I do believe that there will be a few that will go out there and really kind of, um, again, challenge the status quo when it comes to free to play. But I do think all this is evolving, yes. Yeah, and I, I like that take because kind of what it sounds like you're almost getting to is that these aren't two separate entities. Like, it's not like Web 2 sits over here and Web 3 sits over here. It's really just that gaming is moving forward in general, and these companies may or may not start sampling certain Web 3 techniques at some point in time after they have more market validation. And, and, I, and I do believe that, like, when we talk about Web 3, like, I, I, sometimes when I talk to people that are not necessarily in the industry that I think they, they hear this and it's, it's hard for them to understand it better. But the way I kind of like shape the narrative when I usually talk to people is that um, I start with a simple thing that the internet is always growing, it's mm -hmm. evolving and it's changing. And the thing is all what, all we're really seeing is the, the next, what I believe is the, uh, some of the, the, the more prominent technological innovations to the internet, whether it's this anti-piracy software, the internet layer called Ethereum that potentially could, you know, be able to kind of help with digital rights management, right? And then, or we're talking about the the, the money in the internet, if it's Bitcoin, or if it's another currency that would be sovereignless, right? I think these things are powerful narratives talking about how the internet now has changed and has now been able to accommodate for other things. And these things activating things like creators and being able to allow people to have jobs on the internet based upon content creation. It just goes on and on and on. That. But it does start with this, this belief that in reality, that when you look at the internet, Today, the internet's smaller than we've ever seen it before. It is literally, in my opinion, 10 websites. It could be more for you, it could be less for other people, but it's all within decentralized platforms. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that that's how we've done it. But in the process of doing that, there's a lot of value that was captured that was basically being, um, that, that basically the content was created and submitted for free. And as yeah. a result of that, the profit was actually taken by those platforms. And I do think that there's profit sharing, don't get me wrong. And obviously like platforms like YouTube, there's ways to be able to monetize. But the reality is um, at the end of the day, if the content was just one of one or the scarcity was there and that was the only thing on the internet that did it, uh, just imagine how long that creator can monetize effectively that co content. I would, I would actually wager they could monetize it beyond their lifetime. No. Generation, Easy. generations of it. And it's, yeah. it's, it's the complexity of having, you know, digitally scarce and provably immutable resources that stay on chain yeah. in a permanent fashion. I mean, it's a completely different world. And I, you know, I like to consider, you know, here from a, from a commercial standpoint, right? Because obviously when we talk about these centralized entities, these 10 websites that effectively own the world, right? You have your, uh, you know, your Google Play, your, your App Store, your, all these different, you know, like centralized marketplaces. How do you see these breaking out over time in tandem with Web3, right? Because obviously they're known for taking these onerous transaction fees, right? And it's difficult to publish in certain ways and they have all these regulations. How do you see that working alongside Web3? So the way I, I like to look at it and I look at, I look at Web3 and, 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 and the thing is, I want to be careful because I think we're just scratching the surface on the actual ways effectively digital monetization can happen. Um, and as a result of that, like we're seeing it already with what's considered to be like um, marketplaces and, and buy sell. Right. And we saw that with Axie. And, and, and I believe that's just the start of many other types of uh, formats and smart contracts that will leverage that kind of like commerce type of activity. And I think I think it's going to be very interesting. It'll be many different types of, I guess, monetization models beyond just what we conventionally know as in-app purchase. IAP is that we see it today. Um, definitely is, is very straightforward and, it, and it's conventional and it works really well for a web 2.0, web 2.5 world as of right now. Right. And it works well for a developer that's actually charging directly, um, to that actual user, um, a specific consumable or non-consumable good. But the reality is, um, it does nothing for what's considered to be like, if you think about that, like how do you address 
uh, third party to third party transaction. Like it's mm-hmm. not something that was actually really kind of um, baked into what's happening when that purchase. Uh, the re- when I look at that, um, what I see is this. I actually don't see it as adversity and I don't see it as a threat. I see it as opportunity. And the reason why I see it as opportunity is at the end of the day, when you think about these centralized platforms, they do have like, um, there, there's definitely a, a powerful force that will shape the narrative of what they actually put out as product and as services. And that's the end user. And if the end user, I believe, really, really wants to be able to do it, I, I do believe um, that is really kind of the, the start of these platforms wanting to go out there and be able to accommodate for that, right? And if the interest is there, the demand is there, I think that's step number one. And that's the wait and see, like, is there enough of a market? Is there enough volume? Like, is this something that we should even start leaning into? I think, but at the same time, I think the other thing that needs to be considered is the guardrails that are tied to this. What I mean by that is if you think about marketplace transactions just in general, right? These centralized marketplaces have KYC AML. They've got fraud teams. They've got anti-money laundering teams. They have teams for compliance. Um, And I think that's important to consider because in a decentralized world, who is the who who is the actual entity or decentralized entity that's going to provide those type of goods and services? Mm-hmm. We're sure that bad actors aren't necessarily doing bad things on blockchains. Mm-hmm. And I know that's probably impossible to, to enforce, but I think what it is, um, we talk about centralized platform where the liability is squarely on the liability of the CEO. It's a lot more challenging and it's a lot more risky. And it's, it's the risk, I think, that also keeps them at bay because it's the questioning of whether or not that NFT that was sold for $11 million, like the legitimacy of that NFT. I'm not pointing to any NFT that was sold for $11 million. <laughs> but the reality is someone bought a digital commerce, you know, uh, through digital commerce, an NFT, $11 million of a rabbit with a pancake on top of their head. Like somehow the mind has to justify that's the fact. Look, the, it, the market is always right, right? But <laughs> let them choose yeah, so the value. And I, I, would, I would say this, I would say that it does have value and to certain probably um, demographics, it, has, it makes more sense. And to other demographics out there, it probably doesn't make sense at all. They're like, wait a second. I mean, a piece of art is worth, uh, an analog piece of art is worth less than this, this thing, right? So it is almost like there's a generational, um, leap of faith that needs to be taken that this is actually saying, right? But the reality is when we look at all that, like, yeah, these transactions are actually happening. Now, how they're happening and who's actually buying them because it, it is pseudo anonymous or anonymous mm-hmm. to a certain degree, it's awfully, awfully hard to tell um, what exactly uh, these uh, these government entities are really dealing with, right? And I'll stop there because I think that's a whole thing around like questionable, like purchase uh, merchant, like questionable purchasing and commerce on the internet. That potentially, like I think, like uh, like all the other centralized platforms would want some guardrails to be able to ensure that the actual transaction is real, counterparty to counterparty, and it isn't something that's either washed or is it something that necessarily is facilitating some level of cap- of, of money laundering activity. Yeah, so that's the guardrail risk side. Uh, the last thing I would say is this: is um, the third thing is around brand. This is important. So when we look at the centralized platforms that are out there right now. Brand is super important. I think when you think about the products and services they have and how much their brand really means to them, imagine if someone were to go out there and buy one of those devices that this specific uh, brand would, would have. And their first experience is they go into the NFT marketplace that this, this, uh, this, that this centralized marketplace that they created. And they go there and they get rugged and they lose out on $10,000. That's what we call a bad brand experience. Yep. And I can think of a marketer that would allow that to happen because the brand is so important. Nobody wants a brand where the users are like getting fleeced or they they basically um, find themselves in a perilous situation where they bought NFTs that may not be even NFTs, right? So to me, I think that is another final piece of it. It's, it's around brand. So I think those three things are what, and I hope I answered your question. When we look at from a centralized marketplace point of view, that I think keeps them from really kind of going further within Web3. Yeah. No, Steve, I, I think that's really insightful because what it, what it seems like you're getting at over and over here, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's that the technology itself uh, obviously has promise and it's yet to be proven. And really all that separates, you know, the integration of some of these core Web3 technologies into the Web2 giants is just some market validation and some guardrails, right? Like they need the assurance that this isn't going to nuke their brand as soon as they take off all the centralization components and let the community decide what they want, right? So they need that emphasis on guardrails. They need to be able to protect their brand and ultimately they just need 
need a little bit more market validation at the end of the day. I think, I think having a positive user experience is super important because you just spent all this uh, time and energy and, and to be able to, you know, get these loyal users to fall, like to be a part of your brand. I think, I think as a result of that, like the last thing you want to do is provide a poor user experience where either, either it's, it's about the fact that like, um, of what we just talked about, or it's even, even when we look at the actual way that execution of purchases are made that require MetaMask and these other parts, not that I have anything against MetaMask. I love MetaMask, but at the same time, if you think about all the different hoops we need to go through with our, uh, our, co our cold storage wallets and all these different steps, it's too, there's too much friction. And, and to like a, many of the companies out there that really respect having a seamless, amazing, beautiful user experience, they would not want to do that. Yeah, no, no, no. It's 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 much more than the the neat login yeah, yeah. with one click. You got ten clicks before you're even halfway done. Um, yeah. No, Steve, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. And I, you know, as someone in your station, right, who sits kind of at the intersection of all these things, and you see a ton of venture across the Web three gaming space, do you have you know any advice for builders, people who are setting out on their own journey right now, trying to build within Web three gaming? What would you tell them? So I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question. And I could tell you, um, I've, I've thought about just overall the ge general direction of what we've been seeing as Web3 gate, like p potential Web3 gaming projects and overall just deals that we're seeing uh, even at Mechanism. And the part that I'm just, con that I pause for concern is that I think there is definitely, um, in, in the, 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 I think the overall Web3 gaming deals that we see we see almost um, the same sort of gameplay types that we typically see within free-to-play games. And the reason why that's good and bad is I understand why it's good because it helps to kind of price it out and it de-risks it because you know there's a market for that type of gameplay. In other words, Battle Royale. In other mm -hmm. words, Match. In other words, Forex SLG. Like it's there. We know it's there. And we know how big that market is. You can probably ask Machine Zone how big Forex is. It's there. But, but at the same time, the reason why I'm concerned about it is because the reason why free to play is at where it's at right now is like I said before, we need more innovation. These are some of the smartest, most efficiently run gaming companies out there, the biggest, baddest ones. And even like if you think about Blizzard and you think about what they're, they've done with Overwatch 2, right? Which is free to play, right? If you think about that, Diablo on mobile is free to play. Even then, like the, 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 it's already going that way. So the question then remains. How does Web3, do you, do, you, do you basically take conventional, traditional genres of gaming that are out there, they're proven to make a lot of money for Web2 games that are free to play, and you, and you find a way to be able to kind of corkscrew in the Web3 piece, or are you better off trying to take that entire thing about the genres around, web, uh, around these free to play games and think about the creativity on what Web3 can offer. And from there, being able to create gameplay styles that are maybe very uniquely different. And it could be that that is what wins the day. That is the Web3, th that those are the games that are new, that are stimulating, that are creative, that have nothing to do with two race cars racing along, right? Like I, I've seen too many of those models. I'm like, wait a second, like, that's like, a lot of racing <laughs> the, fifth, the fifth horse race game that we have here yeah a lot of battle royale like there's a lot of battle royale games i'm like oh man there's a lot of battle royale. there's got to be in my opinion um developers that are that, that obviously are are willing to think differently and potentially um take even a bigger risk i know it's a big risk like i get that and watch they're gonna all come to the mechanism and say it was steve cho told this to like go out there on a big limb and you better help us right but the reality is um that is where I think uh, the state of free-to-play is right now. It's the, the creativity around gameplay styles. Um, there's really not been a lot. And I, and I think that Web3, that's where they could rise the occasion. It's not so much competing directly with, a, you know, a, uh, probably like a, a tried and, and proven uh, like a puzzle game like Candy Crush Saga, which has massive resources, huge live operations effort. Like you are going against a juggernaut. You're going to come out with a puzzle game that has Web3 in it. It could work. But then... The reality is maybe you should rethink how puzzles are actually made. And is there a way to make a better puzzle using Web3 um, properties when it comes to like scarcity, when it comes to ownership, when it comes to just overall provenance and immutability and all these different things, interoperability. Like, is there something there that we can make this a different type of puzzle across the entire internet? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not obviously brave enough to be a startup founder, but someone out there that's listening to this, like, 
definitely find that. If you find that, like, come find me, and I'll, I'll definitely give you the time to at least listen to what you have to say. Steve, for sure. I, I love that take on because you're totally right. There's really two paths you can go. You can either redeploy a standard game, and you can just sprinkle some Web3 dust on it, or you can really consider what makes Web3 so special. How do I design yeah. the gameplay mechanics around these things to really, really make this into a unique offering? I think that's fantastic advice. And and Steve, you know, I I, I really, really appreciate you coming on here. Uh, is there anything here at the end that you want to shout out real quick? Uh, anything that Mechanism's got going on that you want to share? I, I think for us, like really, um, when I, when I kind of look where we are right on the cycle, um, it, it's a very interesting time. I would say that everyone's heads down building. And um, th this is the one thing I've, I've been very um, open and can't, like overall just transparent about. Um, any of the Web3 projects that are out there currently right now, if you do need help and you need my help to kind of give my, my past experience advice on the different things that I know, um, just know that um, I'm here to help you. And I, I do believe, and, and Sam, I'm humbled that you have me on this show because it just shows like, I, and I think I told you this when the first time we had a call together, like I think for us to be successful for this next cycle, it's not we're all going to make it in the end. We all got to help each other. We got to all work together. Web3 is at this point, uh, definitely from a, a concept of, of uh, at least from a tech standpoint, it does make sense. What we need to see is some really big decentralized applications just hit the board in a big way. And we got to all help it. We all got to push together. Because if we see that, we see a market. If we see a market, then we have a huge opportunity in front of us. And I do believe it's the future. And everyone in it, I got to tell you, you're brave. I love you, and let's keep on going. Let's all work together to get there. And if you need my help, come find me at Mechanism, okay? Steve, that is an awesome message. I love that. Um, no, and please, you know, listeners here today, please do reach out, you know, if there's anything that can be helped with. We're all in this boat together. Steve, thanks a bunch for coming on. Really do appreciate it, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Sam.